If the patient has C5 verticalopathy, they may have weakness in the deltoid muscle and the way to isolate deltoid testing is to have them keep their elbow flexed, keep the whole arm up and test against resistance of the deltoid muscle this way. You can test for sensations in the epaulate area. They may have numbness localized to this region or they may have paresthesias or tingling in this region. The biceps reflex is generally considered to be a part of the C5 nerve root innervated groups. Patients who have C8 radiculopathy will often complain of pain going down their medial forearm and into the ulnar two digits of their hand. They will have weakness in long finger flexors which are tested by having the patient curl his fingers and test against resistance to ensure that C8 is working. There is no reflex to test C8. If they have C3 and C4 radiculopathy, that's more difficult to evaluate. They may have paresthesias in this region here for C3 radiculopathy or in the trapezius region here for C4 radiculopathy. But oftentimes these can be confused with just axial muscular neck pain without radiculopathy. The only way to definitively diagnose a C4 motor, a C4 meter do fluoroscopy of the diaphragm and see whether the hemidiaphragm moves equally on both sides as the patient breathes in and out. One of the pathognomonic findings in myelopathy is abnormal reflexes in the upper extremity and lower extremity. In the upper extremity, patients with myelopathy will have exaggerated deep tendon reflexes. So the inverted radial reflex could be exaggerated, the biceps reflex could be exaggerated, and the triceps reflex will also be exaggerated. In addition to exaggeration of normal deep tendon reflexes, they also have a set of pathologic reflexes in myelopathy. Amongst the pathologic reflexes are the inverted radial reflex where you tap like you would for the brachioradialis reflex and instead of getting wrist extension or elbow flexion you get reflex flexion of the fingers and thumb so it would be just like this. That's the inverted radial reflex. There's also another reflex that's useful in determining whether a patient has myelopathy and is known as the Hoffman reflex. So you flick the nail of the long finger and the patient has reflex flexion and contraction of the thumb and index finger, thumb and index. That's the Hoffman reflex. You may also have an abnormal reflex known as the scapular humeral reflex where you tap on the spine of the, of the scapula or the acromion and the patient reflexly will abduct his humerus or abduct his scapula just like that. Patients with myelopathy also have abnormal hand findings. They may have wasting of the intrinsic musculature and they're unable to rapidly clench their fist and open their fist. Another hand finding in myelopathy is known as the finger escape sign. You make sure that the patient's forearm is resting comfortably on a pillow or two pillows and you have them hold their fingers out completely extended. You'll find that within a few seconds or 15 to 30 seconds the ulnar digits will drift out into abduction and flexion just like that. When you're testing for sensory deficit, in addition to light touch, you should also test other modalities of sensation, including sharp touch with a sharp object, cotton buds, heat and cold can also be tested. This is particularly important when you're trying to rule out myelopathy because you want to rule out involvement of different parts of the cord which carry signals for different types of sensation. When a patient comes in to the office with low back pain, it's very important to ask exactly where the pain is. 
when they say back pain, they may mean anywhere from here all the way down to here. Generally, when we talk about back pain, we refer to lumbar spinal pain. Other causes of back pain are mid-back mid pain, which may be muscular or postural, or axial neck pain, which as physicians, we generally wouldn't include in the term back pain. They may have coccidinia, which is lower down in the coccyx and the tailbone region, which again would be a different category. If they have back pain, try and find out whether the pain is in the midline, off to the midline, or whether it's actually referred pain going down towards the buttocks or sacroiliac joint. If the pain goes out to the sides, it may very well be muscular back pain or low back pain, but it could also be a referred pain coming from degenerative changes within the discs or facet joints in the lumbar spine resulting in nerve irritation and some referred pain to these patterns. When they have pain going down from the lumbar spine all the way down into the back of the thigh, we would still hesitate to call that radiculopathy from the lumbar spine. You can have referred pain from the lumbar spine go all the way down to the back of the thigh. It's only when the pain starts going below the knee in a specific radicular pattern that we would start thinking that the patient's symptoms were suggestive or classic for radiculopathy. Examination of the back includes an assessment and documentation of the patient's range of motion of the lumbar spine. You should have the patient bend over like they're going to touch their toes and assess the distance from their fingertips to the floor. You can document that in terms of a distance in inches or you can say that the patient is able to reach his mid tibia, distal tibia or ankle level with his fingertips. You should document their range of motion in extension with the patient bending backwards and this is generally documented in degrees from the vertical plane. You document their range of motion in side bending to the left and side bending to the right, again in degrees from the midline sagittal plane. You palpate their back at each level and you check that there is no step off between the spinous processes. And some people with severe spasm on one side from a disc herniation that's irritating the nerves on one side, you may actually be able to feel asymmetric muscle spasm on one side as opposed to the other side of the midline. If a patient complains of leg pain in addition to back pain, it's very important to pin down exactly where the leg pain is. When the person's in pain, very often they don't pay attention to exactly what distribution their pain is in the leg. But it's important to make them think about it because that's what gives you information as to what the potential symptom generator or pain generator may be. If they have leg pain, what I do typically is have them point with one finger how the pain travels down the leg. So it's not enough for them just to use their whole hand and trace it down the leg. I'd like them to tell me with one finger how the pain travels down to the knee, past the knee, does it go to the ankle? Which side of the ankle is the pain on? On the lateral side, medial side, or posterior side? Does it go into the foot? Is it more on the top of the foot or is it in the bottom of the foot? Do they have numbness or tingling in the same distribution? The distribution of the patient's pain and symptoms may themselves provide a clue as to which nerve root is involved. If a patient comes to you with pain going down the side of his thigh that further travels down the side of his calf, the outside of his calf, and then goes down the dorsum of his foot towards the big toe, that's very suggestive of involvement of an L5 nerve root. Similarly, you have other radicular presentations in the lower extremity. 
and it's important for you to know the radicular distribution of dermatomes in the lower extremity. The way I like to remember them is to say that L1 goes across the groin. L2 curves across the anterior middle third of the thigh. L3 curves across the distal anterior portion of the thigh, generally going across and over the knee. L4 goes down the medial tibia and into the medial aspect of the foot. L5 curves around the lateral tibia and further down into the dorsum of the foot. And S1 goes down the posterior tibia, curves around the side of the ankle and foot or into the sole of the foot.